Uh, thank you so much, Laura and Nathan, for reading for us. Uh, well, welcome again to St. Helens. My name is Gwilym, if we've not met. Um, and if you are joining us here this morning for the first time, then uh, we're in the second part of a three-part series in Exodus chapters 32 to 34. Um, our question for this morning, you'll see it on your handouts. Well, it's really our question for the series. Uh, what do we need to get us back to God? And what do we need to get us back to God? Uh, one of the truly awful things about living in a world that has grown old in its rebellion against God is that we might not recognize the question anymore. We don't think that we're very far from God. Half the room perhaps isn't even sure that he exists and the other half, well, we get adjusted to this feeling of distance, don't we? We think that guessing is just the way that it is. What do we need to get us back to God? It sounds like an empty question, a question that no one in our generation is really asking, susceptible to highly theoretical answers. It's not always been that way. If we had eyes to see, we would not feel that way. Uh, imagine with me the people that we encountered last week in Exodus 32. Uh, they had been rescued personally by the Lord. They had seen, actually seen with their eyes, his visible presence. They had been protected by his presence. They had been fed by him miraculously in the wilderness. They had heard him speak to them. They had stood before a mountain that actually shook with the weight of his nearness. They had entered into a marriage contract with him. And then they had thrown it all away. Uh, the covenant had been smashed. They had seen in Moses' face the fury of a husband scorned. They faced judgment last week from the sword, which you might have found unpalatable. But the truth is that there's more to come. Ultimately, no hope. Uh, the Lord about to leave. Uh, what do we need to get us back to God? What do we need to get God back? For them, these would be the most urgent, the most pressing, the most angst-ridden questions they could have asked. Or, or imagine, if you will, Adam and Eve, um, the day after they were driven away from the Garden of Eden. Uh, their door, uh, the door to the garden, closed forever. Ahead of them, the barren wastelands of a world far from God. Imagine Eve turning to her husband. Uh, what can we do? What do we need to get back to God? It's a question that comes out of the pit of her stomach. Imagine the exiles, a thousand years after Moses, the day after they arrived in Babylon in chains, their eyes still seared with the sight of the temple in ruins, their homes gone forever, their family lost, their land ablaze, all because the Lord has departed. What do we need to do to get God back. If you'd asked any of them, this would not have been a theoretical question. And the truth is that it matters for us no less this morning than it did for them. All that matters in your life will be lost if you don't find your way back to God. All that matters in this world has already been lost, all that really matters in a world that has grown old in rebellion against him. If we could see who he was and what we had done and who we were meant to be, the only question that would matter this morning would be this. What can you do to get back to God? It's a terrible thing, isn't it, to be powerless to retrieve a relationship that matters to us. And we expect, don't we, that even when we've wronged somebody, if we take a step in their direction, uh, then we will get somewhere. If we apologize, or if we act nice, or if we smile sweetly, then they ought to reciprocate in some way. I remember um, Lance Armstrong, I, I like cycling, I remember Lance Armstrong's sense of shock when he received his global lifetime ban from competition for his drug abuse. I know I cheated, he said, but I don't deserve the death penalty. Well, what if you did? Uh, what if there is no way back? 
What if the only right outcome is to, res is to lose the one thing that matters and to lose it forever? Because realistically, what can you do to get back to God? And forget all that nonsense about doing a bit of good. And why should a bit of good on our part impress him? He made the stars. Or you could try saying sorry, but why should sorry be enough? My daughter has taken to saying to my son, sorry's not enough when he's pushed her or something. <laughs> well, maybe for us it's not. We can't tell God that what we did wasn't that bad because it was. He gave us everything. Uh, so what are you going to do? Well, last week we saw Israel facing up to the possibility that there might be nothing that they could do uh, to get them back to God. And if the thought has never crossed your mind this morning that there might be nothing that you can do to get back to God, then it might be a very good place for us to start. Uh, what can we do? What do we need to get us back to God? Well, Exodus 32 to 34, they are the place that throughout their history, the Israelites turned for answers when they had broken the covenant. And when they had broken their relationship with God, this was the place they came because this was the first time they did it. It was the first time that the Lord gave them answers. And this week we begin to see why, uh, because we get a picture of what we need. Um, actually, we got a hint of what we need to get us back to God last week. Uh, even in last week's factor there, uh, passage, there was one factor that made a difference. I wonder whether you noticed it in Exodus 32. When he was for them, um, things began to go better. Uh, the Lord relented, judgment was held back. When he was against them, everything came crashing back down again. I I'm talking about a person, and the person that I'm speaking about is Moses. Um, and that is what we're going to see this morning. What you need to get you back to God is Moses. And Moses understands that too. Um, Exodus chapter 32 and verse 30. The next day, Moses said to the people, you have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sins. You'll see on your handouts that we have uh, two points. First of all, we need another Moses, um, and we're going to begin by looking at Moses' failed intercession before we look, to, look at his uh, successful one. Because if you were listening just now, uh, you might think that Moses is precisely what you don't need. Um, the first time that he attempts to pray for the Israelites, um, he gets rebuffed. Verse 30 again, uh, perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, alas, this people has sinned a great sin. They have made for themselves gods of gold. But now if you will forgive their sin, but if not, please blot me out of your book that you have written. But the Lord said to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. At the heart of this first prayer from Moses is an offer to take the place of the Israelites. Uh, verse 32 again, um, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, please blot me out of your book that you have written. Um, some of the commentaries on Exodus get themselves into a bit of a muddle here. Uh, they reckon that Moses can't possibly be offering to die for the people. I mean, who would do that? So he must just be saying, well, if you won't forgive them, then kill me too. Uh, now, now, leaving aside the, the fact that that interpretation leaves Moses sounding slightly churlish, um, uh, sort of trying to leverage God with some emotional blackmail, uh, uh, a former day Jonah saying, fine, if that's the way it is, then I'd rather die. Well, it ignores what Moses actually says. Verse 30, he says, and now I will go up to the Lord's Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. And the heart of atonement in the Old Testament is always, and Moses knew this, substitution. An animal, whether it's a goat or a, a ram or a, a lamb or a cow, it took the place of the sinner. And Moses seems to be offering that he might do that. If the Lord will not forgive the people for free, well, perhaps Moses could take their place and the Lord could strike him. After all, Moses wasn't at the foot of the mountain when they made the golden calf. It is an extraordinary thing for Moses to pray, isn't it? 
um, but his intercession is refused. Verse 33, but the Lord said to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. But now go, lead the people to the place about which I've spoken to you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. Then the Lord sent a plague on the people because they'd made the calf, the one that Aaron had made. Moses' offer is rejected. The Lord will not accept Moses as a substitute. But more than that, his request is rejected too. Verse 33, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt, to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, to your offspring I will give it. I will send an angel before you, and I'll drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up among you, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. And when the people heard this disastrous words, they mourned. Uh, Moses' offer is rejected, but also um, his request. The Lord will not forgive the people. And they get instant judgment, the judgment of the plague, so that just as the plagues had fallen on Pharaoh and Egypt earlier in the book of Exodus, now they fall on the people. And then they get the much worse judgment, that the Lord will not go up amongst them, that he will not be present with them on the way. It's perhaps worth pausing to notice the surprise here. Um, uh, they think, don't they, that that is a disastrous word. And maybe you disagree with them. You think, well, the Lord, he, he promises to give them the promised land, and he promises to send his angel with them, and he promises to drive out their enemies. Uh, what's so bad about the fact that he doesn't go amongst them? If anything, it's safer uh, without him there. But they think it is a disastrous word. And they mourn. They stand pathetically stripped of their ornaments. They mourn. They think that this word is as bad as death. You might think, what's so bad about that? Are you still get the promised land? Are you still get the angel? you still get the help? Is it really so bad if the Lord is not present with you? But of course, this is a marriage. And let me be frank. If my wife were to divorce me, it would be scant cons consolation that she let me keep the house we were planning to live in and sent her cousin to help me move in. The marriage itself is the main thing, the only thing. And so it is a disastrous word. Moses' intercession for the people, make no mistake, it has failed. The Lord has accepted neither his offer nor his request. And so you might think, well, the last thing that you need to get you back to God is Moses. Perhaps the people thought, Moses, come on, try harder. But of course, it doesn't end there because Moses goes again. Uh, point 1b, Moses' successful intercession. Um, skip down to verse 12. Don't worry, we'll come back to the verses in between. Um, verse 12. Moses said to the Lord, see, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you'll send with me. Yet you have said, I know you, Moses, by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. And consider, too, that this nation is your people. And he said, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to him, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us, so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken I will do, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. It's instantly obvious, isn't it, that the outcome of this prayer is different, um, this exchange. Um, everything that Moses asks from the Lord, the Lord gives him. Um, he specifically agrees to go with the people of Israel, 
He even agrees to Moses' cheeky request for confirmation when he says, show me your glory in the next verse. And he says, well, I'll make my goodness pass before you. But the key question has to be, why? Uh, why do things go so much better for Moses the second time than the first time? And the truth is, I've got to be frank here, um, I've changed my mind. Um, I used to think that it was all about the key word grace um, and favor. Certainly it is a key word um, in those verses. So five times in that exchange between Moses and the Lord, he uses the same word, grace, um, favor. Um, uh, and then in verse 19, when the Lord describes what he likes, he, he's like, he, he says that he is the God who shows grace, grace and favor. It is his signature move. And so I thought, well, maybe the problem with Moses' first prayer was that there was too much Moses in it. Uh, he was too self-confident trying to offer himself as the solution, uh, as an atoning sacrifice. And in the second prayer, uh, Moses gets out of the way and he stops talking about Moses and concentrates instead on God and on his grace. But the trouble is that's just not what the verses say. Actually, there is more Moses in the second prayer than there is in the first prayer. Uh, so look again, verse 12. Um, you have said, I know you, singular Moses, by name, and you also have found favor in my sight. Verse 13, if I have found favor in your sight. Verse 16, how will it be known that I, Moses, have found favor in your sight? Verse 17, you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. I just leave the word favor to one side for a minute. Moses seems to be praying for the people on the basis of his special relationship with the Lord. I have found favor in the Lord's sight, and therefore perhaps I can bring them, the people, with me. Um, actually, the verses that we skipped, they push that point even further. And so look back to verse 7. Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, um, far from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise up and each would stand at his own tent door and watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship each at his tent door. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friends. Oh, and Joshua was there too. I think almost certainly that paragraph is out of sequence. It's not that Moses prays once and then some stuff happens and then sometime later Moses prays again. Rather, verses 7 to 11 has been put there as background information. This is the kind of relationship that Moses had with the Lord. All the people, they stand far off. At the tent of meeting, it's pitched way outside the camp. But Moses, even Josh was outside. But Moses, he goes in and he speaks to the Lord face to face as a man speaks to his friend. You see, I got this completely wrong. It's not that Moses thinks, okay, well, I've got nothing to bring, and so I'm going to fall back on grace, God's undeserved kindness. No, he thinks, okay, so maybe the relationship that I enjoy with the Lord could save the people. I know the Lord. I have found favor. He knows me by name. I am his friend. Perhaps for my sake, he might forgive them. Lord, for my sake, would you go with us? And verse 15b, put it down. If your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us? And the extraordinary thing is that the Lord says, yes, verse 17, this very thing that you have spoken, I will do. For you, singular, have found favor in my sight, and I know you, singular, by name. It's an extraordinary moment. 
Now, we all know what it's like, don't we, to be treated differently for the sake of somebody else. It was brought home to me very sharply um, a few years ago. Uh, somebody, actually a dear friend, um, through a combination of misunderstanding and, and my own sin, um, had been alienated by me quite badly. And she met with me and, and my wife. And uh, before she explained why it was that she was upset, um, she tried uh, gamely uh, to highlight some of my strengths. And the list wasn't very long, um, but uh, near the end of the list, she said, most importantly, and she said, and this is not a small consideration for me, you're the man that Jenny loves. That's it right there. Um, I didn't have much credit, uh, basically none. Jenny had so much credit that the mere fact that she was associated with me uh, was what I needed to give me a way back. Uh, just imagine being so sure of your relationship with God that you could say, God, for my sake, forgive them. But that is what Moses does pray here. And he's right to do so. This very thing that you have said, I will do for you because I know you by name and you have found favor in my sight. What do you need to get you back to God? Well, you need Moses. That's what you need. It's not that Moses twists the arm of an unwilling God, uh, that he forces God to forgive the people against his will. Uh, you, you might think it looks that way initially. And the Lord is angry, Moses prays, uh, the Lord relents. But the truth is that from start to end, um, it has been the Lord's idea to get Moses to this place. Um, it was the Lord who saved Moses first. It was the Lord who appeared to Moses first. It was the Lord who commissioned Moses. It was the Lord who set Moses up as an intermediary between himself and the people, and then as an intermediary between himself and Pharaoh, and then as an, an intermediary between himself and the people again in the desert, and as he gave the law. He's done everything that he's done in the book of Exodus through Moses. Um, the Lord has made Moses his friend. Uh, the whole of Exodus is preparation for this moment. Uh, it's the climax that God has been working towards. So it would be a travesty to think that Moses steps in here like some plucky young man to twist God's arm and to get him to do what he didn't want to do. This friendship is God's creation. But the people really do need a Moses. If Moses were not there to intercede, all of the grace and mercy of God would stay locked up. It really is his relationship with the Lord that rescues the people. And we really do need a Moses. Um, it's tempting to think that we just need someone to pray, a prayer. Um, anybody could have un unlocked all that grace and mercy just by using the grace word, praying the right prayer. Or perhaps you might think we need a mediator, um, uh, as though Moses is just setting up the idea of somebody to stand between God and the people, a pattern that priests might fill later in the history of the people. But that's not right, because Moses isn't replaceable here. Um, you couldn't swap in Aaron, the high priest. Um, the priesthood in the Old Testament, it worked when the covenant was working. But when the covenant was broken, when it was in tatters and the priesthood were disgraced, well, you don't need the office or the concept of a mediator and the idea of an intermediary. No, you need a person who actually has this relationship. Um, an individual who really does know the Lord face to face. Somebody that can say, Lord, you know me by name. You actually need Moses. And you might think, and you'd be right, that for the Israelites reading this, that's actually quite bad news. It's all very well for the golden calf generation to say to them, well, you needed a Moses because they had one. But, but what about the Joshua generation? who were going in to conquer the land after Moses had died. What if they broke the covenant? And what about the exiles living a thousand years later when they broke the covenant? How will these chapters help them to find out that you need Moses? Where are you going to find Moses from? And then it gets worse because actually you need a better Moses. And turn back to chapter 32. 
Verse 30 again. The next day Moses said to the people, you have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. You see, the truth is that Moses' first intercession was not wrong. Um, He was right to think um, that their sin needed to be atoned for, to be covered. Atonement is right at the heart of these five books of Moses. It's the, the main theme of Leviticus, the central book. It's the main theme of Leviticus 16, the central chapter of the whole of these five books of Moses. Um, It's the note that the books of Moses end on. Um, In Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy ends with a song, Deuteronomy 32, where Moses tells the whole story of the people of Israel in advance. And it's a story that is going to focus on their breaking of the covenant. So it's relevant. You're going to break the covenant, he says. And after you break the covenant, there is a hope of return. And the song ends on this line. In that day, you'll atone for your people, your land. Uh, Moses is right to think that atonement might, might be important. And he's right to think that atonement comes through a sacrifice. Again, these five books of Moses, they drive that home. So think of Isaac, who um, is saved through the ram that's given in his place. Or think of the Passover, where the Israelite sons are saved through the Passover lamb dying for them. Or, or, or think of Leviticus 16, where the, the goats take the place of the people. Um, Think of Judah, um, Judah the rascal, um, who redeems himself by offering to take the place of his little brother Benjamin, and in the process gives the longest speech in the whole of the Pentateuch, well, the whole of Genesis anyway. And he's right to think that sacrifice matters. He's right to think that atonement comes through sacrifice. The only problem with Moses' prayer is that Moses is the one who's praying it, because in the end... Moses' relationship with God isn't enough. Um, He has his own death to die. Um, He's going to fall outside the promised land for his own failure. And so he can't take the place of the people because he has his own grave in the wilderness to lie in. We don't need Moses. We need a better Moses. Now, we'll see next week that that has implications for the kind of restoration that we get in chapter 34. Um, Chapter 34 is wonderful, it's a new covenant, but it is not the new covenant that we need. Um, But for now, it just increases the problem, doesn't it? If we needed Moses, that would be bad enough. But if the exiles needed not just Moses, but a better Moses, someone who was like Moses, who shared a friendship, who could share a friendship, a face-to-face relationship with the Lord with others, but then someone who was better than Moses who could take their place, well, that's almost impossible, isn't it? A better Moses with a relationship so indestructible that he could die their death and still live to share his relationship with God. And where would you find one of those? And where would you find one? You might think that this chapter of the Bible is actually quite cruel. And this is the place where Israelites turned for a thousand years to find hope. Um, Covenant breakers, uh, they turned back here. Uh, And what do you find? Well, what do you need to get you back to God? It's not enough to say sorry. It's not enough to try harder. It's not enough to have sacrifices. It's not enough to have a gracious God. In the face of a broken covenant, what you need is so unique and so one of a kind that you can give it a name. You need Moses, someone who calls the Lord his friend, someone who has a relationship with God that he can share. You need someone who's like him, but better. I mean, empathize for a moment. What are you supposed to do with that? It leaves you with nothing to do, doesn't it? You can't say sorry to God. That's not going to help. You can't mourn. You can't try harder. You can't pray. This is pure grace. You can't buy it. You can't procure it. You can't force it. A better Moses, that has to be given. Like Moses was given. The only hope you'd have if you need Moses but better, is that grace might produce the otherwise unproducible. 
You might think that this chapter is quite cruel, but actually Exodus 32 to 34 did not produce despair, it produced hope. Because at the same time as it describes the need for a new Moses, it also describes the kind of gods who would give him. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious gods, um, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and mercy, forgiving iniquity and rebellion and sin. He will not always chide, um, nor will he hold our sins against us forever. Now that kind of gods is the sort of gods who would find a way, um, even if it means doing it himself. Um, peering into the last days, the book of Numbers says this, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, a scepter shall rise out of Israel. Um, there has never been a prophet like Moses who knew the Lord face to face, but there will be, even if it requires the Lord himself to strap on his armor and to intercede. Um, the extraordinary news of the Christian gospel is, of course, that that is what the Lord Jesus has done. Um, he is the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God. Um, he's so obviously a product of divine grace that Paul can call him the gift. But he's like Moses, a relationship with his father that he can share with us. I mean, it's extraordinary, isn't it? It took 40 years to make Moses. It took an eternity uh, for the relationship that the Lord Jesus has with his father to be forged. And he shares it with us. He's unlike Moses, um, so sure in his relationship with his father that he could lay down his life only to take it up again. Well, it's extraordinary. Moses is a hero. Perhaps I can make atonement for the people. What kind of a man is it who could die our death and then share his risen life? And what we need to get back to God is the Lord Jesus. And the purpose of these chapters for Israel was to focus their hope on him. But the thing that struck me is that we really do need him. And that is the, the scandal of Exodus 32 to 34 and the scandal of the Christian gospel. You know, we'd like to believe, wouldn't we, that um, restoration to God is within our grasp and we're used to the idea that reconciliation with other people is something that we can do. And so whether it's by our efforts to make amends or by our contrition um, or by our attempts to improve ourselves or, or even by the earnest conviction that it's just a misunderstanding, we might like to think that reconciliation with God is something that is within our power. It, it's not. And failing that, we might like to think that it's within God's kindness and what we need is a benign God, a kind God, who will overlook our failures, who will be merciful to us. What we need is the grace of God. Well, that's not enough either. What you need is Moses. Well, no, what you need is Jesus. Without the man himself, without his friendship with his father, without his eternal friendship, you have no hope. You have nowhere to go. And without his extraordinary kindness in laying down his life for you, you have no hope and nowhere to go. He came for us and he died for us and he shares his risen life with us. What we need in a world that has grown old in rebellion against God. Um, is the Lord Jesus. Um, Exodus chapter 32 and chapter 33 and verse 11. Uh, Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friends. Uh, Deuteronomy uh, chapter 34 um, and the last verses. Verse 10. There has not arisen a prophet since in Israel like Moses whom the Lord knew face to face, uh, but there has now. Let me pray.
Heavenly Father, we praise you so much that there is hope for those who have broken the covenants. There is hope for those who are far from you. Um, not um, the hope of our self-improvement or even our sorries. And not just the hope of your benignness, but the hope that in your very great kindness, in your overwhelming compassion, um, you have yourself come in the person of your son, the Lord Jesus, that there is hope because he has a relationship with you that he is willing to share. There is hope because he has an indestructible life that means that he can die our death. We want to pray, uh, Father, this morning that you would help us to realize that what we need in the face of our sin and a broken relationship with you um, is the Lord Jesus himself. And we ask it in his name. Amen.